Assalamu alaikum, my dear brothers and sisters. Once again, Jazakumullah khairan. May Allah grant you all that which is good for you and your families. Ameen, Rabbil Alameen. We're here now back with another session. Where did we stop at the last session? The Hudaybiyah Treaty was at risk of being violated. By whom? By the Prophet? No way on earth. Remember, the prophets never breached any covenant. Then from whose end? From the end of the other side. Let me tell you. Remember Bani Bakr? Bani Bakr joined alliances with who? With Quraysh. Bani Khuza'a joined alliances with the Prophet ﷺ. Bani Bakr and Bani Khuza'a used to have battles and wars before the treaty. Bani Bakr had so much hate to Bani Khuza'a that they could not manage it properly. And the hatred grew more and more because they saw Bani, uh, the people of Khuza'a, they are alliancing with Muhammad وسلم, and they're also getting stronger and stronger. So now their hatred and jealousy, it's a mix. May Allah forgive us. So Bani, Bani Bakr said, let's go and attack Bani Khuza'a at night time. So because it's not clear who is attacking them. So they, Bani Bakr, spoke to Quraysh, their alliance, and said, would you help us with like weapons? And they didn't just help with weapons, Quraysh helped with people. So now Quraysh and Bani Bakr together went on attacking at night, breaching the covenant of no war for 10 years. No, they went at night time at the tribe of Khuza'a. And guess what, brothers and sisters? Bani Khuza'a was not ready for this. They came at night and start killing right and left. People were praying at the night, killing, killed them while they were praying. And then some people from Bani Khuza'a, what did they do? They got shocked and they ran and they fled away. Where do you think they ran away? To the mosque, the sacred mosque around the Kaaba. Why would they do that? Because it's known in that area that whoever goes there and is present is never ever physically harmed. Even if the one who's there killed your own dad, you still do not touch them in that part of the land. SubhanAllah. So the Bani Khuza'a, they fled there so that no one can hurt them. So when Bani Bakr came, the leader who was named was Nawfal, he was told, Rabbak, Rabbak, your Lord, your Lord, Nawfal. What did Nawfal say? La ilaha lahu al-yawm, Nawfal has no God today. La ilaha illallah. You see how anger? May Allah forgive us. So he said, Not, La ilaha lahu al-yawm, no God for me today. So they said, Nawfal, this is the sacred land. We can't go that far and killing them there. We're like doubling down on our, our sins and the wronging and so on. Nawfal says, you people steal, steal in that sacred land. Now you're acting all religious that you don't want to get revenge. So that influenced them. And they went and attacked in the sacred land and they killed the Bani Khuza'a that were there. What's the point here to share with you? There's a lot that can be said. But you see how Nawfal belittled the small sin. As a result of belittling the small sin, the larger sin became even easier to do. It's no longer as difficult to do. And that's something we have to take very serious. All of us have shortcomings. When someone does a sin, make sure you address it. Make sure you say, you know what, this is wrong. I got to do something about it. I need to make sure to stop the root cause of why I did it. Because if you don't address your smaller mistakes and you don't care about them and the sins, the bigger ones will not be as difficult for us to commit. May Allah forgive us and protect us. You know when the alarm goes off in the kitchen or next to it, what do some of us do? We grab like a blanket and we try to push the smoke away because the alarm system to stop doing beep, 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 right? But before we do that, we need to see where is the smoke coming from. Similarly, when you're about to do that which is wrong, your heart, your consciousness does that beep, beep. You don't shut it off. See what went wrong. If you don't address it, it will cause a bigger problem. So the point being is that address the smaller sins so we don't fall into the bigger ones as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What did He say in the Quran? Do not come close to zina. 
Do not come close to zina. Zina is wrong, but don't even take the small steps that lead to it. May Allah protect us and make us people of modesty. Amir Rabbil Alameen. One of the people from Bani Khuza'a managed to escape and run away, not to the sacred mosque land, no. He ran away to Medina. He won, ran away to his alliance, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he started giving poetry. Allahumma inni nashidun Muhammada. Oh Allah, I'm, I'm addressing Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he started complaining to Muhammad about what happened. The disbelievers of Quraysh did this and others did that. They killed us while we were prostrating and bowing to God. So the Prophet ﷺ, is he going to be faithful to his promise of support his alliance? Yes. He said, Nusirta ya Amr ibn Salim. Amr, we got you. You will be helped. You will be supported. Allahu Akbar. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who always, always keeps his promise and is faithful with the covenants. I will share with you the story. Wallahi, it just, just shows you the remarkable, how remarkable Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is. Many years ago, in the Battle of Badr, and the Muslims were about 317, 317, the disbelievers were about 1,000. So any man that can join the Muslims will be great. We need every possible man in, in, to be involved. What happens? Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman and his father, may Allah be pleased by both of them, they escaped Mecca to go to Medina. When they escaped, they got captured by the people of Quraysh. The people of Quraysh, the, the enemy, the dis disbelievers at the time, they will not let go of Hudayf and his dad until they make a promise and a covenant. What is it? That any upcoming battle that will come between the Muslims and Quraysh, that Hudayf and his father does not participate in. Hudayf said, for sure, for sure, just let go of us and we promise, we promise you we will not join uh, an army uh, of the Muslims against you. What happened? Brothers and sisters, the battle of Badr came that first major, major battle. And then who came to the Muslim army? Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman and his father. So they told the Prophet ﷺ of the promise they made to the disbelievers, Quraysh at that time. What did the Prophet ﷺ say? You know what he said? He said, you guys, Hudayfa and your dad, go back to Medina. Go back to Medina. In Sarifa, lahum bi'ahdihim. We shall fulfill the promise given to them, the covenant, عَلَيْهِمْ And we'll ask Allah's help and assistance against the enemy. لا إله إلا الله. As desperately as you need a person to help you out in that battle, yet he kept his promise to the enemy who's trying to kill him. لا إله إلا الله. May Allah make us be trustworthy people. May Allah make us never betray. You know what the Prophet ﷺ teach us? He says, أَدِّ الْأَمَانَةَ إِلَى مَنْ اِئْتَمَنَكْ Fulfill the trust to those who entrust you. وَلَا تَخُنْ مَنْ خَانَكْ And do not betray the ones who betray you. May Allah allow us to follow the teachings of Islam. Ameen Rabbil Alameen. Brothers and sisters, with that being said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has a plan. What's the plan? We will go and assemble an army to Quraysh. But no one shall tell Quraysh anything. We will do it as secretly as possible. Come all the way from Medina, come to Mecca and shock the people of Quraysh. So not ready. Agreed? Obviously, Rasulullah gave that command, the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the army is being put together, assembled thousands of believers. Remember, Muslims are growing in huge numbers during time of safety and security, the peace, the treaty that, that happened. Brothers and sisters, all of a sudden, what happened? A companion. Companion? His name is Hatib. May Allah be pleased by him. He wrote a letter to the people of Quraysh detailing the plan of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he gave it to a lady and privately, no one knows, no one knows privately, go right now, send that letter to the people of Quraysh, to Mecca. You think no one knows? Someone knows. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of your companions by the name of Hatib wrote a letter and gave it to a lady to forward it to the disbelievers to share the plan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Allah from above seven heavens. He sees the end on a rock in a dark night. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that knows what happened, knows what's happening and knows what will happen and knows what would have happened if something else has happened. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that sees what we do, Allah that hears what we say, Allah the one who knows what we think of. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing is difficult on Allah. Revealed it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ali ibn Abi Talib said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam requested me, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Az-Zubayr and Al-Miqdad, these three companions, what did he tell them? Go to such and such garden. It's a distance from here. Go to that garden. In there, you will find a lady in a howdaj, a portable-like tent on a camel, basically in that garden that will be heading towards Mecca, towards the people of Quraysh. With her, with her is a letter from Hatib giving the details of the plan to the enemy in Quraysh. Go quickly, get the letter. Ali ibn Abi Talib said, and we went so fast, the fastest pace possible to go and rush to go get the letter until we arrived to the garden. And we saw the lady in that portable tent or small room on the camel. So we told her, take out the letter. Give us the letter. She said, I have no letter with me. I have no letter. What letter? So they settled the camel down. They did a complete search, complete search, and they could not find the letter. Huh? They could not find the letter. Brothers and sisters, the Prophet wasallam. he said there's a letter. Look what Ali said. Do you have the belief of Ali? Check it out. He said, ما كذب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم The Prophet of Allah وسلم, never in his life did he lie. Ali cannot see the letter. Al-Miqdad, Al-Zubair could not find it. They searched it. I cannot see it. I cannot touch it. Nothing. But what I know is there is a letter. So even though the intellect on a general basis, there's no letter, but their belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is such strong belief that there is a letter. Not this is, people will accuse some of us Muslims, oh, you guys do this, this and that, which God said, the Prophet said, you don't know the wisdom behind it, you don't know this and that. No, it's not because we're uneducated, it's because we are very educated. It's because we trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We trust the Prophet, peace be upon him. He said to us so many things. Truthful, not once did he lie. So there's a credibility proven by God subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there is a letter, there's a letter. So look what they said. Ready for this? They said, Listen, you either give us a letter. She has a letter. She is also contributing in committing treason. She's contributing in this treacherous act, to be more specific, okay? And this is going to cause damage. You have this letter. What you did is wrong. Give us the letter or we will strip you off your clothes. When she saw that they're serious, hold on, hold on, hold on. Then she had braids and the letter was hidden inside the braids. She took it, gave it to Ali, Zubair, Al-Miqdad, and the letter said, from Hatib, just like how the Prophet ﷺ said, and they got the letter and they rushed back to Medina. The Prophet ﷺ is there, Hatib is there, companions are there, gets the letter, and the Prophet ﷺ says, ما هذا يا Hatib? What is this Hatib? What is this? ما هذا? This is a treacherous move, brothers and sisters. So Hatib wants to explain himself. He says, لا تعجل علي يا رسول الله. Just, don't be hasty. Let me just tell you what, 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 what happened, okay? I am a person that has some family in Mecca, but very small. I don't have a huge family that will back up, you know, one another and help out one another. Unlike the people here who are the immigrants and have large families there. So I was worried if anything goes wrong in Mecca, when me sending the letter, when I send the letter, the people in Mecca will appreciate that from me. As a result of their appreciation, they will protect my family. I have no support there. So I was hoping this will help out my family who is a minority in Mecca. And O Prophet of Allah, 
I did not do this because I disbelieved. I did not do this because I left Islam. No, my heart is full of belief. So the Prophet وسلم, what is he saying? إِنَّهُ قَدْ صَدَقَكُمْ Hatib has said the truth. In what sense? What he said. He did, does truly believe, even though, brothers and sisters, he committed a major, major, major sin. And before I proceed, this is just a quick note to all of us here. SubhanAllah, how it is possible. May Allah forgive us and protect us. Someone to commit such major sin, a treacherous move against the Prophet Sallallahu yet still have love to Allah and His Prophet Sallallahu May Allah grant us wisdom and protect us. Umar bin Khattab was there. Umar said, Ya Rasulullah, hand me this guy. Bring me this guy so I can kill this hypocrite. This is treason. So the Prophet ﷺ told Umar, Umar, listen. أَلَيْسَ مِنْ أَهْلِ بدر? Did Hatib not participate in the battle of Badr? Did Hatib not fight in this grand battle, the one of the grandest, the elite of the elite which helped the Muslims? And Umar, perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would forgive Hatib and the people who participated, whatever they do after that, for the grand deed, good deed that was done in battle of Badr. Umar started to cry, فَدَمَعَتْ عَيْنَاهِ and he said, Allah and his messenger know best. Indeed, it brings emotions and heart softening to know how forgiving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. As much as that sin is major, yet Allah will still forgive. Brothers and sisters, go to Allah with a big, big good deed. What do you have? Do you have something, inshallah? Do you have something that you've done yesterday, last year, a week ago, sometime in your life? There's such a great, massive good deed that inshallah will be means, means, to help you on the Day of Judgment for all the shortcomings that we have committed? Do you have? Do I have? Let's make an oath to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have something major that we present to Allah. Let me give you this example. Let's say you have a bank account of $1,000. Pretend, pretend your bank account holds your good deeds. So 1,000 good deeds. Anytime you write a check, anytime you write a check, that number is the number of bad deeds. So when you have $1,000, 1,000 good deeds, and you make, for example, a check or a sin that is 500 bad deeds, it's okay. Now it's okay as in, it's fine, you can commit a sin, astaghfirullah al-azim. But you still, inshallah, have hope and chance by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your good deeds are still there. You still have 500 good deeds. 1,000 minus 500. It's just an example, not a perfect one. Now the issue is that when we go and commit a sin, the check is 10,000, and all what you have is 1,000. May Allah protect us from such moments. May Allah make our good deeds a lot larger than our bad deeds. And may Allah forgive us and protect us. So go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And anytime you do a shortcoming, one of the best ways to get that sin erased and removed is by doing a good deed that replaces it. May Allah protect us. Amin Rabbil Alameen. Brothers and sisters, Hatib stays with the army. Allah still protects the Prophet Sallallahu And everything is completely secretive. No one knows about anything that is happening. Quraysh has absolutely no clue. You know how large the Muslim army is? Are you ready to hear the number? The Muslims are 10,000 in number. 10,000 believers, 10,000 soldiers. Six years ago, Battle of Badr, how many were they? 317. You see how Islam spreads during peace? Islam spreads with that peace tree that was made and people accepted all what the Prophet wants. Once, he just give me room to convey. People want to accept good, khair. People don't want to accept also khair. But just give me room to convey the message. That's all what he wants. To belligh ila Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to convey the message. May Allah allow you and I to be people that do that. Ameen Rabbil Alameen. Brothers and sisters, they're coming closer and closer to Mecca. No one has an idea in Mecca. In Mecca they know something might happen. We're worried. What will Muhammad do? But they don't know they're on the way. While the Prophet ﷺ is coming to Mecca, guess who comes and emigrates to the Muslims? Al-Abbas. Al-Abbas is one of the four uncles of the Prophet ﷺ. He comes with his family. What does he want? Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu Muhammad Rasulullah. Can you imagine how happy the Prophet ﷺ is that my uncle got to accept Islam and join? And Alhamdulillah, he joined. Brothers and sisters, as they're coming close, and they were so close, just a few miles away from Mecca. Ready for that? Was night. The Prophet ﷺ, the companions, what do they do? They light a fire. Everyone holds 
a, a fire torch. It's like a dark room, the lights are on. And people of Mecca, they know the plan. Someone is coming to attack us. Something is happening. Abu Sufyan, brothers and sisters, he leaves the city of Mecca, looks at the scene, he is unbelievably shocked. That's it, it's no more a secret, it's known. Never seen anything like that before. Abu, look what Al Abbas does. Who's Al Abbas? He just became a Muslim. Al Abbas looked at the, the scene of the Muslims. He looked how close Mecca is. He said, if this army enters Mecca forcefully, Mecca will be done. No one will be in Mecca. Il Mecca will be destroyed. So Al Abbas rides on the camel of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He rides on the animal of the Prophet Sallallahu and he heads towards Mecca and he's hoping to meet anyone to tell them, to tell the leaders in Mecca to surrender. Surrender because you cannot withstand this army. So surrender, ask for safety. Now, is this a betrayal? No. The plan is no longer a secret. Al-Abbas is trying to work out something for the best of both worlds, for the Muslims and the uh, disbelievers at that time. Al-Abbas is coming, dark at night. Guess what happens? Al-Abbas, he hears someone talking. Who's the one talking? Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan was saying to his friend, listen you, look at this, look at this scene. I have never in my life seen an army that large with such organization. The friend says, you know who that army is? Who is it? I think it's Bani Khuza'a. Remember Khuza'a that were killed? That's Bani Khuza'a coming to attack and seek revenge. Abu Sufyan, he's a military guy. He really knows his stuff. He says, Bani Khuza'a is not that strong to have such army like that. There's no way. Al-Abbas heard that. He says, he called Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan heard someone calling his name. And Abu Sufyan recognized the sound. Abu al-Fadl, al-Abbas. Al-Abbas says, yes, it's me. Then Abu Sufyan said, my beloved, what brought you here? Something serious is taking place. He said, yeah, Abu Sufyan. Yeah, Abu Sufyan. This is the army of the Prophet of Allah. What does this tell Abu Sufyan? That al-Abbas believes that in Islam and al-Abbas accepted Islam. So Abu Sufyan tells al-Abbas, what should we do? There's no way we can handle this. What should we do? He said, listen, the best thing to do is go seek safety from the Prophet ﷺ and surrender, make it, make it peaceful, okay? Come ride on my camel, on the camel of the Prophet ﷺ, and let's head back and talk to the Prophet of Allah. Abu Sufyan said, yeah, sure, sure. Don't forget Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan was the one who was leading the battle of Uhud, killed the companions of the Prophet, sought to ruin Islam and the Muslims. Abu Sufyan, he took a major leadership role in the battle of the trench, which we discussed in the past, with the 10,000 of the enemies coming to attack the Muslims. He was one of the core leaders. So his harm to the Islam and Muslims is unbelievable compared to others. But Al-Abbas said, come with me. So Abu Sufyan and who? And Al-Abbas, Al-Abbas is the uncle of the Prophet Wasallam. They're headed towards the tent of the Prophet. This was at nighttime. Sallallahu Ready for this? As they're coming to the tent of the Prophet, anyone that sees them, he says, Man hada, who's this? So they see the uncle of the Prophet on the animal, the ride of the Prophet. Sallallahu So they say, Hada Ammun Nabi. This is the uncle of the Prophet. Sallam. And they move forward. Until they came, came and passed. And who saw them? Umar ibn al Khattab. He says, Who's this? Al Abbas. Okay, the uncle. Abu Sufyan, you came right to us. Ya Aduwallah, O enemy of Allah, thank God that you came right to us. Come here. He wants to end him. An enemy, this is battle, brothers and sisters. This is war. So Al Abbas sees that from Umar and they go as fast as possible to the Prophet. So Umar doesn't come and capture Abu Sufyan. They went as fast as possible. And guess who's running? Umar ibn Khattab running after him, after Abu Sufyan. And then Al-Abbas comes down. Abu Sufyan comes down. They enter into the tent. And then Umar runs right after them. He, they barely made it, by the way, before Umar. That's how fast he was running. So then Umar al-Khattab said, Ya Rasulullah, hand me this Abu Sufyan. He came right to us, right here. Let us end him. There's no covenant. It's voided. They breached the covenant. You can't say, oh, no war. It's over. Let me go and kill him. So the Prophet, what will he do? 
this man who was responsible, Abu Sufyan, of so much damage to Islam. So much damage. The Prophet ﷺ diffused, calmed down the situation. He told Al-Abbas, let Abu Sufyan stay in your tent tonight and we will talk tomorrow morning, inshallah. When Abu Sufyan woke up and Al-Abbas woke up, I'm going to remind you one more time just to clarify things. Al-Abbas became Muslim, is the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Sufyan is one of the major enemies of Islam at that time. When they woke up, they went to the Prophet ﷺ. Ready for the conversation? Ready for this? Rasulullah ﷺ tells Abu Sufyan, Waihak, what's the matter with you? Is it not time for you, Abu Sufyan, to admit and to accept that there's no deity worthy of worship but Allah? Is it not time for you? Abu Sufyan said, Ma ahlamak, ma akramak, how generous are you, O Muhammad? How kind, how, you're such a patient individual. Abu Sufyan appreciates that. How kind you are, how good you are with a family. You're such a great family person. You know what, you didn't forget where you came from. You're from Quraysh, you're relatives. He says, Abu Sufyan says to Muhammad Sallam, as for that, then you are totally true. You're totally correct. If there are other, God, there, if there are other gods to be worshipped besides Allah, they would have helped me. They would have helped me out today. But indeed, there's no God but Allah. Then the Prophet ﷺ says, Waihak, woe to you, Abu Sufyan. Is it not time for you to admit that I am the Prophet of Allah? Abu Sufyan said, How patient you are. How kind you are. How great family person you are. I'll be honest with you. On this one, I still have doubts. I still have doubts that you are the Prophet of Allah. Al Abbas tells Abu Sufyan, Listen, Abu Sufyan, what is the matter with you? Testify that there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet before you're done, okay? Before you're killed. So Abu Sufyan says, okay. And he admits or he testifies there's no deity of worship but Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is God's messenger. You can tell the hardship there, but we only judge based on what we see and based on what we hear. With that being said, the conversation has ended. Abu Sufyan now is a Muslim. Can you believe that sentence to come out? Abu Sufyan is now a Muslim. Brothers and sisters, when the conversation ended, pay attention to this one. Al-Abbas told the Prophet ﷺ, O Rasulullah, Abu Sufyan likes to be recognized, you know, likes a bit prestige, you know, that kind of helps him soften the heart and things like that. So if there's anything we can do to kind of give Abu Sufyan some status, they'll be appreciated. Once again, not at the expense of displeasing Allah. The Prophet ﷺ already knows that, of course. So the Prophet ﷺ says this, sure. The announcement is to be made in Mecca. Whoever locks themselves in their houses are safe. They will not be fought. Whoever seeks refuge in the sacred mosque will be safe. Fantastic. The addition the Prophet ﷺ made and whoever is in the house of Abu Sufyan is also safe. Al-Abbas liked that and went to tell Abu Sufyan that. Al-Abbas, may Allah be pleased by him, is heading out. The Prophet ﷺ tells Al-Abbas, wait, there's one thing I want you to do. What is? I, I want you to have Abu Sufyan with you. In a spot, there's a spot which is very tight on the way to Mecca, so Abu Sufyan can see the entire army or most of the army, sorry, to go through that bottleneck because that's where the most crowd of the army. The Prophet wants Abu Sufyan to see the army walking in. One of the benefits, brothers and sisters, is that this will help increase the faith of Abu Sufyan and see the prophethood of Muhammad Sallam. It will help him appreciate that and see. Abu Sufyan stood next to Al-Abbas. And Abu Sufyan was looking at the army coming into Mecca. Wow, look at these groups. So he says, oh, Ya Abbas, who in the world is this tribe? Who is this group? He says, this is Banu Sulaim. It's another tribe. Wow, another group comes. Who is this? It's Muzayna. This is unbelievable. Group after group, group after group. He's so amazed. And he says, who in the world is that group? It was a group, brothers and sisters covered with shield and armor, head to toe. All what you can see is what? Just their eyes. That's how much covered of armor and so on. He said, who's this group? 
Al-Abbas says, this is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That's the group and the immigrants and the supporters are with him. Then Abu Sufyan, look what he says. Ready for this one? He says, oh Al-Abbas, your nephews, your nephew's kingdom is so powerful and so strong. Your nephew's kingdom is just out of this world. Al-Abbas said, Ya Abu Sufyan, this is not kingdom. He's not a king. This is prophethood. This is prophethood. It's revelation from Allah given to Muhammad Sallallahu that makes him a prophet. Then Abu Sufyan acknowledges. He said, you know what? That's so true. Naam, naam, naam. Brothers and sisters, Abu Sufyan walks into Mecca. Ready for this? People are scared. So Abu Sufyan makes the announcement. Whoever goes into my house is safe. Whoever locks themselves up in their homes are safe. And whoever is in the masjid in the sacred mosque area is also safe. And everybody floods away, go to one of these three safety locations. The streets are empty. Things are quiet and the Prophet ﷺ is walking towards the Kaaba, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was the area, brothers and sisters. This was the area where the Prophet ﷺ was persecuted. People physically harmed him. People emotionally harmed him. People used to call him a liar, majnoon, someone who lost his mind, a sorcerer. A kahin, all these attributes given to him. They went as far as making fun of the death of his son. When his son, his baby boy, I'm not saying even an adult child, a baby boy died, they made fun of that. That no one will carry your last name. You are Eptar. No one will carry your name. You'll eventually your last name, your lineage will end. Thank God. That's how bad they were. They went as far as throwing stones at him where his feet would bleed. That's what they did. They contributed. The Prophet ﷺ, not just him, what they did to his companions, what they, they have caused to his family in pain. Some of the companions, such as the sister Sumayya, may Allah be pleased by her, the first one to die as a believer from the torture that they have done. All of that, these were the areas. This was the land. May Allah forgive us. So the Prophet ﷺ is walking, brothers and sisters. He sees... 360 idols around the Kaaba. He has a stick. With him, that stick, what does he do? He hits and strikes one idol after the other. When he strikes the idol that used to be worshipped besides Allah, it would fall on its face and it will break. And the companions contributed 360 idols. And when the Prophet did that, you know what he said, brothers and sisters? He used to say, جاء الحق وزهق الباطل The truth has come, falsehood is gone, falsehood is vanished. إن الباطل كان زهوقا Indeed, falsehood is ever bound, will always be temporary and then leave, it, be, it will be gone, inshaAllah. And that's something for all of us to appreciate. You see falsehood strong, you see falsehood powerful, has a crowd to it. But we tell you something, according to this verse, when the truth comes, that strength of that evil, of falsehood, shrinks, becomes weak, becomes destroyed, insha'Allah. May Allah allow you and I to be people of truth and not falsehood. And may Allah make you and I means of guidance to others. So brothers and sisters, when this happened, the idols were destroyed. The Prophet ﷺ asked for the keys of the Kaaba, And he got the keys. And he entered into the Kaaba, and there were idols there. And he destroyed the idols. And then he locked the door of the Kaaba while he was in the Kaaba. But he took such a long time. He stayed in the Kaaba for a long time. What was he praying? What was he doing? I just said it. He was praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was praying to Allah, humble in victory. And when he was in the Kaaba, the people start coming out, surrounding on the mosque sacred area waiting what will happen to them then the prophet ﷺ opens the doors of the kaaba ready for this opens the doors of the kaaba what will the prophet ﷺ do the prophet ﷺ starts with glorifying allah allahu akbar allahu akbar allahu akbar allah is greater than everything and anything then he says la ilaha illallah wahdah there's no deity worthy of worship but allah alone 
These idols basically are nothing. It's only Allah to be worshipped. Sadaqa wa'da. Allah fulfilled his promise. Number two, number three, wa nasara abda, and Allah gave victory to his slave. Wa hazam al ahzab wahda, and Allah was able alone to defeat the confederates, all the people that ganged up together against the Muslims. Allah alone defeated all of them. And one of the very famous speeches that took place on that day, in a narration that is hasan nighire, so it's a sound narration that reaches that level due to other references that strengthens it according to several scholars. What's that narration? The Prophet wasallam, brothers and sisters, ready for this? He tells the people all in front of them, silent, looking at the Prophet, what will he do to us? They know what they did. So the Prophet وسلم, said, ما تظنون يا معشر قريش ما تظنون أني فاعل بكم What do you think, O oh people of Quraysh, that I will do to you today? What do you think I will do? So they said, Khair, you will do nothing but good. Akhin Karim, Wabnu Akhin Karim, you are a good noble man who is the nephew of a good noble man. So the Prophet, وسلم, look what he says. He says, La tathrib alaykum al yawm. No blame on you today. We will not bring up the stories of the past. I will not blame you and rebuke you and, and reproach you. I will not do that. Yaghfir Allahu lakum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive you. I, from, from the Prophet's end, I forgive you basically. And I pray to Allah in addition that Allah forgives you. Why? Allah is the most merciful of all those who have mercy. How powerful is that? How powerful is that that the Prophet's ability to forgive such group of people, such a large number. May Allah make us people who forgive others. Brothers and sisters, can we learn this from the Prophet sallallahu can we be able to forgive? Yes, yes. You have the right. When someone wrongs you, you want to take وَجَزَاءُ سَيِّئَةٍ سَيِّئَةٌ مِثْلُهَا That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. That's an option, right? What does that mean? The retribution, the payback of an evil act is that you respond back equally. But there is a level above that, which I pray to Allah that you and I reach, which the level of the Prophet wasallam. What did Allah say? فَمَنْ عَفَى وَأَصْلَحْ The ones who forgive and reconcile فَأَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ Their reward is on Allah. If you forgive, Allah tells you, if you forgive, you reconcile, I got you. Your reward is with me. I will reward you. Ya Allah, what's the reward? I have no response to you. The ayah doesn't tell me the reward. But you know what we know? This makes it even more beautiful. How is that? Brothers and sisters, when a king in this world tells you, Ahmed, Khadija, Sarah, Yusuf, whatever your name is, may Allah bless you, whoever you may be, call you by your name and says, I, the king of such country, will have a gift ready for you. What will you think? The gift is equal to the wealth, to the power, to the generosity of that king, correct? You expect something big because it's a king. What about the king of all kings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When he tells you, if you forgive, your reward is on me, I will reward you. That gift, that reward will be equal to Allah's generosity, Allah's capability, and Allah's dominion. Allahu Akbar. And when, to help you forgive, brothers and sisters, and yes, do we forgive everybody? Anyone and anything? Some of the scholars, they teach us, forgive. That's the best, best option. But the people who may not deserve to be forgiven, are the ones, when you forgive them, they increase in evil. When you forgive them, they increase in evil. These people may not be worthy of forgiveness, and Allah knows best. That's some of the scholars, they mentioned that. But to the most part, brothers and sisters, we have brothers and sisters, spouses, children, parents, siblings, colleagues. Wallahi, many times our fights and dispute is not worth what's happening. To cut them off, not even greeting, not even saying salam. We're not being, we're not telling you be best friends like how you used to be, but have a connection. Salamu alaikum, peace be upon you. Eid Mubarak, may Allah bless you in this holiday, so on and so forth. To help you forgive brothers and sisters, think of how lowly this life is. This dunya is not worth much. The Prophet Sallallahu he passed by a dead goat with a chopped ear. Like, looks miserable, dead. Maybe flies, insects on it. So the Prophet ﷺ says, who would like to have this dead goat for one dirham? Very cheap price, one dirham. 
the companions, they said, Ya Rasulullah, O Prophet of Allah, we would not want this goat even if it was for free. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Fawallahi, I swear to God, the world in the sight of Allah is of a lower value than this dead filthy goat is to you. This is the dunya. This is the, this life. It's not worth many of the problems that we have with our loved ones. Forgive, may Allah grant you Jannah. May Allah elevate your status. Brothers and sisters, forgive and Allah will forgive you. Forgive and Allah will forgive you. That's what the Prophet ﷺ said. اغفروا يغفر الله لكم. So think how lowly this dunya is, this worldly life, and think of how grand the afterlife is. That's the real deal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you in ways to make everything fruitful to you in terms of forgiveness. And wallahi, when you forgive, many times you do yourself a favor. You have all that weight of grudge and uh, pain and sadness. As one of the people said, when you're holding a grudge against someone, it's like you drinking poison and wanting the other person to die. When in act actuality, you're harming your own self. May Allah make us people of forgiveness the way the Prophet ﷺ forgave all these hundreds and thousands of people. Yes, be, I'll be frank with you. There might be a few, there are, there are a few people whom the Prophet ﷺ would not forgive. Very few, but the majority, all forgiven. All those people. May Allah make us people of forgiveness. Ameen Rabbil Alameen. So we can be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, when this was said, all these people that you can think of, many of them accepted Islam. How many? 2,000 people. 2,000 people, no sword, no bloodshed, no killing all the hundreds of people, nothing forgiven. And they accepted Islam. Brothers and sisters, the Prophet wasallam stayed for about 19 days, 19 days in Mecca. The Prophet wasallam got news. Two major tribes, Hawazin and Thaqif, what about them? They joined forces, assembled a massive army, they want to fight till death. So much so, they brought their wives and their families with them. They have these two options. That to them, we want to fight Muhammad and the Muslim and end them all, or they kill us all. We don't want to ever be ruled under Muhammad Can you believe that? They'd rather die and have all the families destroyed. How will this battle take place? What will happen? All of these things. They want to meet at Hunayn, it's a valley, and they're ready there, the enemy. What will take place? May Allah protect us. May Allah grant us long life to be able to tell you what's going to happen with the life of Rasulullah and his companions at that time, so we can all benefit, inshallah. Thank you so much for listening and watching. May Allah grant you all Jannah. I appreciate you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.